Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sabbath School Study Group. This is a ministry of change ministry, and our desire is to lift up Jesus, and we do that by the study of the Word of God, because as we study the Word, that Word changes us. And speaking of changes, that's what the focus of this lesson today is, how because of what Jesus has done, and when we not just uh, believe or know, but accept that internally in our lives, we are a new creation. Daily, we are made over in his image. And so that drives us then to daily boast, to daily testify to the work he's doing in our lives. And so that's why we're here today to understand why this new creation concept is the spark to this boasting in Christ. So, Lord, we want to pray now that you would speak to our hearts and help us to understand this truth so that we can receive this triumph in Jesus name. Amen. Galatians 6.14 is our main verse for the week, and it says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Take note of the last half of this verse, by whom, because of Jesus and his work, the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, these are our anchor texts. These are the verses that we're going to look at for this lesson today, starting in Galatians and going all the way back to the Old Testament to, again, see the promise of God as our creator. So of the big three, the first point for the day is that to understand that the failure of, quote, circumcision is in our application, not in its meaning. Circumcision was the right given to Abraham to symbolize that he belonged to God. He was putting his faith in God to fulfill his promise in the same way he, his house and all his descendants um, exercise this right. And the Bible does not speak against it as the act itself is being bad, it's when the act replaces the actual experience of salvation. See, when Paul says, behold, I say unto you in Galatians 5, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He's not saying that circumcision is bad. He's saying that if you're using circumcision in place of believing in Christ, that's a fail. Down in verse 4, he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Is this Paul saying now that the law is ineffective? The law is done away with or no good? Absolutely not. What he's saying is that if you're using the law as the means to salvation, that's not grace. That's a fail as well. And when Jesus speaks in Matthew 23, verse 27, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Jesus is not speaking against the virtue of the outward beauty, being a clean, whited sepulcher. What he's speaking against is if you have this outward cleanliness, but then this inward darkness, that is what he's speaking against, not the outward beauty, not the law, not circumcision and what it means. All of these things are good destinations, but now we understand that the means or the road is not paved by what we do. It's paved by a belief and a faith in Jesus Christ. So this is why God is having to create something new, not because what he has instituted or given has failed. It is because we have failed. We are duplicate. We are hypocritical. We have broken the law. We have taken circumcision and embraced the symbol and missed the whole gift of salvation. So now when we go to the second point, when we understand God is our new creator, what justification does, it declares me clean inside out. This is why it goes to a level that circumcision, the law, and, and even outward religiosity cannot go. Because in Galatians 6.15, for in Christ Jesus, in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. So circumcision, okay, so he's throwing out of the way. He's throwing away legalism. Well, not even uncircumcision, okay? He's throwing away lewd living. In other words, living in the flesh, living on your own terms and doing whatever you feel like doing. The gospel throws both extremes away and presents the concept of being made a new creature. When you are a new creature, you don't even need circumcision and you don't and you won't live in uncircumcision because you're a brand new you. Second Corinthians 5:17 says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and look, all things are become new. You know when you've gotten something from the store because of the bag. 
that is a part of the experience, especially for the ladies. When you go to a store, imagine if there were no bags. I'm not just talking about from the convenience standpoint, but they just gave you whatever it is you got and you're just carrying it around. Nobody would really know if what you have is new or old, yours or stolen. But when you're carrying it in that bag and it has that name and that label on it, it lets everyone know I have something new. And it's no different in our spiritual experience. We are in a new bag. And when people see us, they don't see us. They see the label on the bag. They see the mark. They see the hand of God, the fingerprint of grace on our lives. So this is why Jesus says to Nicodemus, he answers and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the gateway, the door to boasting in Christ, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and it will always be flesh. This is what the the hypocrites were dealing with in Matthew 23. They were trying to stay in the flesh, but tape or, or stick a new label on the front. And God says it doesn't work that way because verse six, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again, a new start. And the wind blows where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh and where it goes. So it is with everyone that is born of the spirit. You can see the effects of God in the life by how the person lives. Even better said, how that person loves. Here's a picture of the one millionth Porsche 911 rolling off of the factory floor. And one way that you know that this Porsche is, is different is, well, because I'm telling you. But when you look at the picture, notice all the other new cars around it. How are they wrapped? They're wrapped in the company seal. They are, in effect, sealed with the label on the front, on the hood. So you see right off that this is not just a Porsche. This is a new Porsche. This happens to be um, one of my dream cars that I would like to have at some point in time if God wills. But if not, it's okay because I'll trade them in for some wings one day. But the newness is evidenced by the label. And so you expect it to run well. You expect it to run new. You expect it to behave a certain way. In the same way, this new car is just a, a, a poor but, but I guess okay reflection of the real newness that God wants to manifest in our life the moment we receive Jesus Christ. Because God is wanting to do this newness. God is wanting to create this newness because that is how he sees me. He wants to change who I am inside out because that's exactly how he sees us. In Hebrews 4 verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God sees us in x-ray and it's deeper than physical x-ray. He looks at us in a physical, emotional x-ray vision that sees all that we are, not just what we do, but even why we do it. Because Psalm 33, 13, 14 says, the Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. God is able to see the entire habitation of the earth. He looks out. And he's able to see on this expanse all of the children that he has created. And he sees them again, not just in their physical state, but even in our emotional, spiritual state. From the inside out, God sees us from his holy habitation. And First Chronicles 28, 9 says, And thou, Solomon, when he's speaking to him, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. Because, or for... The Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. So if you seek him, he'll be found of thee. But if you forsake him, he'll cast you off forever. And not because he'll leave you, but because you will leave him because you don't think you need him. And so God, the amazing creator that he is, sees us in a 3D way that we ourselves can't even see. And God is allowing us to understand this experience to see that if this is how he sees us, this is where he is working. This is where he wants to affect change. This is where he wants to operate on an emotional, spiritual level, a mental level. 
and the changes that we experience in this level will manifest themselves in physical, tangible, relational ways with others that we see. I'm so glad that we serve the creator. I'm so glad that we don't have to look to be modified, but we can be made over. How? It is as simple as accepting the gift of Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. That can happen right now in a prayer, in a conversation between you and the Lord, because the act, the gift has already been given. God's just waiting for us to unopen it, believe it, and live it. Until next time, let's all remember that in Jesus Christ, change is good.